Hello, my name is Dennis Lipman, and I'd like to read to you an excerpt from my book, A Yank Back to England, The Prodigal Tourist Returns. Year One, Dagnam, Chapter One. I parked our rented car on the sidewalk by a dusty privet hedge and looked down the street. There was nowhere else to park. And there were still no trees. The front porch that was shared with the house next door was now enclosed with a mock Tudor facade and glass doors were crisscrossed with black plastic leading. With Francis by my side, I entered the shared vestibule and knocked on the door of my parents' home. Hello, Dad. Hello, Mum. Hello, love. Smiles, hugs, old eyes glinting with emotion. I pointed at Francis, nervous, almost casual. Smashing, isn't she, Mum? I can see that. More hugs. See yourself down, then. Mum beamed. Silence for a moment. Then suddenly, everyone was very busy. Lou sorted out teacups. Mum started reorganising cake slices on a plate. And quiet happiness permeated the air. Now you listen to me, son. I've got to tell you straight. You too, girl. He said, wagging a finger at Francis. The wedding. I, I, I know you want us both there, but, you know, I would have given me eye teeth to be there. But our age, son. Dad, it's OK. I understand. I tried to sound reassuring. A few years ago, it would have been different. Lou lowered his voice to a gruff whisper. But now, your mother, you know, she's got her legs. It's OK. We understand it's a long flight, even for us, said Francis. Well, you're both in there, aren't you? Said Jessie, moving on. And we're bleeding well glad of it. And you, son, you must be busted for a pee. I am, I certainly am. I sprinted up the stairs to the loo. Your mother and me, we went earlier, so you can take your time. Go on, you, go on, you know where everything is. I knew where everything was. The house had one toilet and everything lay in close proximity to everything else. Growing up, we seemed to live in even greater proximity to one another. Not that nearness led to closeness, far from it. Our house was a tiny shoebox of a place, a two-bedroom, unitarian, cold-water council house, devoid of charm, with a living room and kitchen downstairs, and two bedrooms and one bathroom upstairs, all connected by a very narrow passageway and a twisting staircase. Still bloody cold, it's still like bloody blast monkeys up there, Lou chuckled good-naturedly. Y yes, just a bit, I shouted back down to him. Hard to believe it's spring. I need to go now myself. Oh, well, um, uh, Frances started for the door. I moved quickly to get ahead of her. Follow me, I said. I'll explain how it works. Explain? Frances raised an eyebrow a little. I tried to reassure her as best I could. The bathroom consisted of a huge toilet that looked like a well, which, above which was a big black cistern with a ball and chain attached to it, containing enough water to drown a sack full of cats. I explained rather apologetically that after your toilet is complete, you must grip the ball attached to the chain. Then you step away from the ball and pull down sharply. Whatever you do, don't remain seated when you flush or do not remain in close proximity to the seat and try not to attempt this procedure in a state of semi-undress. Here's why. At this point, to demonstrate, I jerk the chain. Sound of clanking metal, thump of pipe, then suddenly a tidal wave of water gushed into the toilet bowl with the force of the Red Sea closing over the Egyptians. The water splashed downwards, then spiralled upwards, splashing the seat in the immediate vicinity. Then, just as quickly as it appeared, the water was sucked away again, emitting an echoing burp, followed by the sound of what can only be described as a giant gargling mouthwash. Then the system started to refill, making a steady shushing sound, rounding off with a metallic clank. Spectacular, isn't it? I could see Francis was impressed. Well, I'll leave you to it then, darling. Good luck. A couple of minutes passed. Uh, where do I wash my hands? asked Francis with growing concern in her voice. As there was no sink in the bathroom, I conceded that was a good question. Use the bath, I said. Several inches from the toilet was a long, narrow bathtub under a heating system that resembled a megaton bomb. Such an object should have been located in the attic or stairwell, but here the enormous canister was suspended ominously above the bath. 
Just put the stopper in and run some water in it from the cistern, I added quickly. And don't forget to mix. Mix. In the States, when cold and hot water come gently together, mixing is not required. In my parents' house, the hot water faucet spat liquid that could produce third degree burns on contact. By contrast, the cold faucet pumped out ice water that could easily congeal a slashed artery in a matter of seconds. The only way to survive the plumbing was to mix. Only when faucets were shut off was it safe to swirl the water and so create a bearable temperature in which hands could be washed. Probably another reason why the English are innately patient at supermarket checkouts, long-suffering when waiting for hospital appointments, and very good at waiting for buses. Our Job-like forbearance, you see, is tested from the moment we wake up. The English who do not possess this kind of fortitude, like me, tend to emigrate.